The Tiger by William Blake, uh, perhaps one of his best known poems. Uh, what I'm probably going to assume, I think this is fair to assume, is that when you have been doing some reading around this, you've probably found this uh, quite a difficult poem. Uh, I think this poem works on many, many different levels. Uh, and it's taken me about an hour to try and break it down into something I think which is simple and manageable. So I think for some of you, what you will be doing is, is you'll have a knowledge organiser in front of you and it will have some fantastic notes on there. Uh, some of you will be looking at the notes and you'll be thinking, oh, this is like really, really hard. Um, and it is. Um, don't don't be don't be put off by that. I think this is quite a difficult poem. And uh, if you've been uh, out hunting on the net, uh, an awful lot of what you will have read will have been a kind of degree level stuff. Um, it's either degree level stuff or key stage three stuff. So what I need to do is to try and uh, balance it slightly more towards a degree level than the key stage three stuff. Um, but I've come up with a reading which I think hopefully should be understandable to most of you. Uh, what I'm not going to do is I'm not going to annotate as I go through uh, due to my scroll, um, but uh, I will point to various things as and when I need to point to them. Right, so the reason why we're doing this now is because this poem is linked to the Lamb. Um, and in the Lamb we had the uh, innocent childhood questioning, focusing on uh, Christ as a figure of purity and forgiveness. Uh, thus leading us to, uh, or us understanding that there were hints of vulnerability. Uh, therefore, does innocence perhaps lead to a dangerous state? Uh, perhaps uh, a world of innocence is blind or... a uh, a symbol of innocence or a, uh, something like a child uh, that is innocent is blind to the evils of the world. Uh, therefore what the tiger does is uh, I think what, what Blake is trying to do is to force us to consider the contrary states of uh, human nature. Uh, and in this case, what he's doing uh, is he's got the strength of the tiger uh, versus the weakness of the lamb. Uh, and if you think about the tiger itself, well, what is a tiger? Um, a tiger is it's a, it's a, an enormous creature. It's a very, very powerful uh, creature. It's a very, very destructive creature. Um, uh, a man-eating tiger uh, is, is, is often... Um, is often killed because it's believed that once a, a once the animal has a taste of man, uh, it will carry on becoming a manny in tiger. Uh, it's very destructive, but it is also an immensely, an immensely beautiful creature, uh, with those stripes on the background, uh, on, on its uh, the, those stripes and the the, the, the beautiful orange colour uh, that it is. It's, it's so it's it's uh, a symbol of energy. Uh, a symbol of power, a symbol of beauty, but also a symbol perhaps of destruction. Uh, you might argue, we could argue that the poem is in awe of the tiger. Uh, so Blake is in awe of the tiger and uh, he's trying to show its power, it's in beauty, uh, therefore it being the antithesis of the lamb, which is meek and mild. Um, we have to think about this is not a poem about a tiger. Uh, the tiger is a, a symbol. It's symbolic of uh, something. Uh, therefore, perhaps what we could say is that Blake is trying to show uh, the power of the creator. Uh, maybe the creator of good versus the creator of evil. Um, and what he's doing, I think, is questioning, uh, questioning a view of God. Um, God is not necessarily a, uh, or the creator is not necessarily a binary figure. It's not necessarily, uh, we, we see God as pure goodness, but God creates things which are evil also, uh, and things which are bad also. And I think the tiger exemplifies this. When we read this poem, there are many, many, many oppositions. Um, if we just focus on the very, very start, tiger, tiger, burning bright, um, there are oppositions within the words burning itself. Uh, burning um, is some, something that's glowing. Uh, if we have something that's glowing, then we have that perhaps typical Renaissance image of goodness. Uh, also, although burning itself, and you know, burning, 
burning with passion, per burning with pride. It's a good thing. It's a powerful thing. But obviously burning is a very powerful thing. It, it, it makes us think of uh, perhaps uh, fire. Uh, it's a hellish um, image. Uh, it makes us think of destruction. So we have tiger, tiger burning bright in the forests of the night. And again, forests, it's a, a, a place teeming with life. It's a place teeming with, in a sense, purity, nature in its purest form. Uh, but it is a very, very dense place. It's a very, very fearful place. It's a place where we can get lost. Um, and the forests of the night, obviously within night we have uh, the imagery of darkness, therefore um, negativity. And he says, what immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? So the question being asked is, what good could make you? Okay, well, what God, sorry, what good, what God could make you? Um, a God that has created something that is so beautiful, uh, but a God that has created something that is so destructive. And this is where the word symmetry comes in. Okay, that, that whole idea that there are two sides to this animal, uh, there are two sides to this poem. Um, we have the God that made the tiger, is it the same God that made the lamb? How could a God that's created some, something so powerful and destructive create something so meek and so mild? If we consider the form of this poem, uh, um, we have a similar, we, we, we end up with a similar idea, this idea of contradictions. Um, a lot of this poem uh, is trachaic, okay, tiger, tiger, burning, bright, and it ends, uh, and I, I'm going to give you a word here, it's catalexis. I said I wasn't going to write something, but here I am writing something. Uh, cataleps catalexis is where there is that missing foot at the end, okay, tiger tiger burning bright so what we have is we uh we have the three trochies here we have those three uh four stresses four trochies four stresses uh but we are missing um we are missing that foot at the end and that's what catalexis is that's what catalexis is and throughout this poem we see the truck is we and it's it's very insistent it's very very driving and it's driving questions tiger tiger burning bright in the forest of the night what immortal hand or eye but then we get to the iams could frame thy fearful symmetry there are lots of questions within this poem one two three four five six and so on and so on and so on and there are two types of questions that are being asked. There are demanding questions, interrogative questions, questions which are demanding an answer, and questions which are asking, questions perhaps which are acknowledging, questions which are um, perhaps uh, the speaker or Blake pondering, okay, asking those rhetorical questions. So what we have are two types of questions, insistent driving questions and reflective questions. And what we tend to find within this poem is the trachaic meter um, frames the insistent questions and those uh, reflective questions, those moments of reflection um, uh, are iambic. So again, what we have is a, a, a poem not necessarily of symmetry, but a poem of oppositions. Uh, if you note the number of questions and note the connective and, okay, burnt the fire of thine eyes, on what wings dare he aspire, what the hand dare seize a fire, and what shoulder, and what art could twist the sinews of thy heart, and when the heart begin to beat, what dread hand, and what dread beat. Perhaps I think Blake, what Blake is doing is, is all of these questions are um, rhetorical questions uh, and the, the, the connective and uh, shows that he has lots and lots of ideas on this, lots and lots of questions that need to be answered. Um, and I think perhaps in a sense this is quite an unsatisfying poem because there is no answer. He is showing that there is no answer. I think perhaps the final stanza echoes this 
when he says because uh, the, the final stanza is a uh, it's it's the same as the first stanza we have this kind of like cyclic narrative here uh, which shows uh, that lack of resolution. Um, and the final stanza is the same as the first. Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forest of the night. What immortal hand or eye dare frame thy fearful symmetry? So the only thing that is changed is the word dare. Okay, and some people have said that this is Blake uh, confronted. In, in, in a sense, it's kind of like confrontational. Uh, what kind of God would dare do this? Um, some people suggest that this is Blake, in a sense, talking about himself as the writer or the artist. Um, he is, in an essence, writing about the tiger. Uh, and how can he possibly dare to write about something uh, so immense, something that only really God cre can create? How can a writer... Uh, confront this idea when the writer is restricted by words alone. Uh, Blake was a romantic poet um, and the romantic poets uh, talked about there being no restriction of the imagination but there is a restriction on how you present that. So is this uh, kind of maybe in a sense a condemnation of the creator or is it Blake reflecting on the fact that he himself could not possibly uh, write about this in the depth that is required. Um, if we have a look at some of the language, some of the language that he uses kind of like reflects uh, that idea. He talks about what the hammer, what the chain, in what furnace was thy brain, what the anvil, what dread grasp, dare its deadly terrors grasp uh clasp sorry and what we see is the language is the uh, the, the language is uh, language uh reflects the elements of creation that is bound in the human world alone so it's kind of supports that idea that i think that blake is looking at this and perhaps even questioning why he is asking this question itself um we also have uh, perhaps this illusion here where Blake, uh, he says, on what wings dare he aspire, what the hand dare seize the fire. Uh, this alludes to um, what wings dare he aspire. It, that can, some people say, that alludes uh, to the fallen angels, the angels that... Um, the angels that try to uh, not usurp God, but the angels that try to uh, equal God's power uh, and were were uh, sent down uh, were the, the fallen angels. Uh, and we have what hand dare seize the fire? Uh, this is a um, some critics say that this is an allusion to Prometheus, Prometheus who uh, stole from stole fire from the gods to give to humans. Somebody was trying to do something good, uh, but still was taking God's power from them. Um, so perhaps trying to be uh, equal to God. Uh, and I think this is Blake um, showing that through his writing, he is he's trying to show something incredibly complex. Uh, but is unable to do so because he is uh, restrained by simple uh, mortal words. Uh, I think if you want a simplistic view of this poem, um, you can look at the idea about how can evil exist in a world created by a good God. Uh, but maybe we could suggest that this is possibly a warning of the temptation of experience. Um, power and our quest for power with power comes danger okay we may see beauty in power but power itself can be incredibly dangerous now that i think is a have tried to make it as simplistic as possible um do look at uh, crossref it um particularly if you are aiming aiming for the a's a stars uh, there are lots and lots and lots of ideas on there that are, are I think, much more complex. Um, try not to tie yourself up in the complexity of it, though. If, if you are struggling, um, persevere for a while. But if you are really, really, really struggling with some of the con concepts uh, presented, um, 
a lot of those concepts are degree level and and it's fine just to go with what i've said um also have a look at the pack that i gave you um I th there's a, there's a really interpret uh, interesting interpretation in that uh which uh, alludes to the fact that uh, the tiger is an allegory for the industrial revolution okay and uh, uh, perhaps the dangers of progress but that's all explained within that pack um I'm not sure whether I've managed to simplify that for you. Uh, I'm hoping I've managed to simplify that for you. Um, we've really only focused on three or four bits of language and we've only really focused on uh, elements of form and we focused on the meaning, uh, perhaps, that how can evil sim uh, exist in a world created by a good God. <laughs>